Welcome back. It's time for another Q&A. This is part nine. Lots of questions. Why wait? Let's get straight to this. As always, I'm going to bring those up here and sit over here so I can display them right over there. So, and as always, I'm going to read through those questions just in case you're just listening to this and you can hear a question and then I will try to answer them. Elliot Marin, 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 Marin. I'm always curious about how other animators learn from fellow animators. For example, you at Island. Do you watch them work? Are they okay with that? <laughs> Creepy. Do you guys sometimes do demos to each other where you share your workflows or tools or whatever? How do you pick those genuine brains around you without looking like a weirdo? Haha. <laughs> also, just know that if I win, an animation team somewhere in the UK will be staying late in the office to watch Spidey and geek out frame by frame. For those that don't remember, these questions were submitted for the Spider-Verse Blu-ray giveaway. Uh, they did not win, <laughs> so uh, they're sad somewhere. I apologize. Now, going about the questions. Do you watch them at work? I don't. Um, it is creepy. Uh, no, I don't watch them at work, um, but do you sometimes do demos? Every now and then there will be someone that presents something or it's part of a show that they want to talk about or it's a tool set that has been developed that someone wants to demo and explain. Uh, that happens for sure. Uh, workflows, not so much, to be honest. How do you pick those brains around you with like a weirdo? It's it's mostly like in dailies, if something comes up with the shop, you can ask um, or just generally you just talk about things like what's your workflow and uh, every now and then, like I said, it's mostly tools that are being developed that someone then posts like, hey, I developed this tool, it's for this. And that sometimes sparks a thread, an email thread or whatever message thread where people then talk, oh, I do it like this or I do it like that or I use this tool and stuff like that. But we don't really have like a round table where we sit down and everybody talks about their workflow. It's not like that. Everybody's very approachable. You can always walk up to someone and ask, so how, how do you do this? And then they will explain it to you. It's a very happy and friendly bunch of dialing. Next up, Abdul Fahim. Hi, when polishing stage, I don't know what to add and polish by now. I make my offsets, arcs, what else to add? Once I asked you in a blocking FNA comment about spline and polish, you told polish is about small details. My problem is what to add, uh, what details to add, excuse me. I have a lot of questions like this whenever I sit to do, whenever I sit to do, I get a lot of questions like this. And I saw a comment, someone asking about polish, please add this to your FNA, which I will. What to add, what should we look for in polish stage? Yes, for sure. Um, as I've gotten a new computer, I was going to say like, and pick up the box, but I already cleaned everything. Uh, the machine is a beast. It's fantastic. I can, I can finally animate again. So I'm going to continue with the most common animation mistakes, uh, FNA, because that's a lot of animation that I want to do in demo. So I'm, and polish is part of that, of the list of things I need to pay attention to. That being said, answering, um, so offsets and arcs, yeah. So you're gonna have all that, and depending on your workflow and how used to you are to uh, you are to animating, uh, you can start adding your offsets even in blocking. So when you have someone, my example is obviously someone jumps and lands. You would have your offsets on your arms and legs on that full extension landing um, already built into your blocking. So after a while, you start so like skipping later steps and you put them already in your earlier blocking because if you pose out a character, you might as well pose it with asymmetry in mind and stuff like that. Um, and I think the sooner you can get into tracking your arcs and not making it a mess and have nice arcs and no pops in your animation spacing, you know, have that already in your blocking there, the better. So you want, you want it to be clean and nice as soon as you can. So it's just part of your initial workflow and blocking pass. But yes, to me, your spline is, uh, um, polish is when you spline things, but I mean, you can also have spline blocking to some degree, right? But to me, the polish aspect is just, it's not like your animation is going to massively change. It's just going to be polished as in just the final details, offsets and fingers, little things on the face and little asymmetry stuff. And just like that, that little extra step that makes it that, oh, that, that's, that's, that was a nice little thing there. But the main structure of a shot would not change. Um, but your problem is that you don't know what to add in those details. So to me, again, it would be definitely asymmetry in body or face if you haven't gotten to that yet. Um, polish as in like finger, specific finger poses, but also offsetting things. Or if you have, have my lens here, if I grab that lens, you can see this here, right? Well, let's focus on my face. Uh, if you hold this here and you let go, things like where you don't just do all fingers keyed, uh, like almost the post to post thing, where you might, depending on the grip and what the intention is, but let's say you might start with the pinky, the pinky ring first, and then you take the fingers off. Or 
if you are grabbing something, this is like a, like a pull lever, 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 or like a whatever me mechanism that you want to pull, my English escapes me. Uh, it wouldn't just be now I'm bringing that arm down, it would be maybe two, three frames before you start squeezing because you want to show that I'm putting more force on it and I'm going to pull it back down. So you're going to squeeze that because your muscles are squeezing and then you're going to pull this down. So to me, those, those type of offsets and little details I put in, or if you do a sidestep or a lean over, you might make sure that the foot is going to compress and squish and on the pivot side of where the foot rolls off. To me, those are the kind of details. Maybe if you haven't put anything in the ears yet, so if a character is smiling, you might have a little bit of up and down uh, in those ears. Um, it's just little details like that, I would say. It's just the, the extra finishing touches that if you don't have them in your shot, the shot still works. It still tells a story. And depending on your budget and your time, you might not have time, uh, you know, because of your schedule to put that in. But if you do have time, then I would put those extra things in there. And it could be just little flourishes and just, just those extra little, I hate to say details, but then you're asking what those details are, but that's that's what I mean. Like anything in the face, in the in the fingers, in the foot, if you have props, if it's a tie or something where you can add extra detail or or just stuff like that where it's it's to me, there are details that make the shot even better and just that, ex that attention to detail that A, not everybody will notice that you may uh, not need to put in there because maybe the story uh, doesn't hinge on those details. But if you have extra time, why not just make it that extra polish? But again, it's not something that if you don't put it in there, that the shot breaks, if that makes sense, right? So everything should be ready and clear and put in in your blocking and blocking plus to sell the story and make everything clear story wise and acting wise. And if you have time, you can put in that extra polish, but it shouldn't break the shot if that polish is not in there. Hope that makes sense. Next, we have, is it Eureka, Eureka Sfray? Eureka Sfray, I don't know, sorry, I don't know. Uh, how do you approach complex acting, like a person crying, falling to their knees and sprawling lifelessly onto the floor in traditional hand drawn animation? Interesting question. Do you approach it in shapes? Do you approach it with line of action, shapes, and then add the arms and legs later? What basics do you need to know about body mechanics? That's interesting because I don't do traditional hand-drawn animation. Um, the Klaus trailer came out and people are commenting or posting things. So there's a visibility of 2D animators out there. I would recommend that you ask them because I don't know. I don't do traditional hand-drawn animation. So in terms of shapes, uh, I don't even know. In my limited, not to be honest, I wouldn't even know. I would probably do just a blob with, like you said, line of action and shape so that everything kind of is right and then drawing bigger details. I mean, you would have, I would assume the body and legs and arms all there. I mean, that's if you look at pencil tests, everything is kind of there rough and maybe as something stops moving, you only animate the rest that does move and then the body, if, it's move, if it moves again, then you draw that again. Uh, I mean, I'm, my opinions will be based on those pencil tests and what I see, but uh, again, sorry, I don't do hand-drawn animations, so I can't tell you. But I can tell you that because of Klaus, stuff is more online about 2D. So I would ask them, go on Twitter, they're out there, um, and then potentially ask them. Sorry for evading that question, but I don't know. Theron Chaplin, Tiron Chaplin. How would you handle a situation where your lead wants you to go in one direction for a shot and the supervisor wants a different way? Say you've already talked with the lead about what the supervisor wants, but he, she doesn't want to hear it from you. Thanks. That's an interesting question. Um, so what do you do, go one by one, um, what do you do when the lead wants to go in one direction for a shot and the supervisor wants to go in a different way? Well, you know, because of the hierarchy, you're going to do what the lead says. And then as you present this, the supervisor have a different opinion. You would just have to, I mean, I would just mention that, well, I, I did this because I talked with the lead and we, we had this idea about going this way. I just want to inform you that that's why we went this way. And if you want to go this way, um, you know, it's, it will change the shot. And if the supervisor um, still wants that to do, the, uh, wants to do that, you would have to go and talk to the lead and just inform any updates, unless the lead is also in the room for the shop presentation. But if not, if for whatever reason you're just in the room with the soup, then I would go and talk to the lead. Hey, I showed it to the soup. These are his or her notes so that everybody's on the same page. Because the thing is, you're always going to have different ideas from people. The lead, the soup, the client, the VFX soup, like many people have different ideas. I think it's okay and it's normal because everybody will approach it a different way, their subjective opinions. This is how it goes. But I think the main importance is that everybody knows what everybody said. 
because that's the worst when you go, when you do something and then the other person has no idea and wants you to do something else and then that person doesn't know about the changes and you're just aimlessly going towards whatever each person wants. Um, so communication is key so that everybody knows. Even if changes happen, at least whoever is did not ask for those changes should know what those changes are. That being said, the client trumps everything. So whatever the client says, you should do what the client says. Um, so you already talked with the lead about the supervisor wants, but he, she doesn't want to hear from you. Um, yeah, but anyway, this goes into company politics and hierarchies and how people are and if they want to hear something or um, you go one way and everybody's okay with that. And then despite everybody wanting that, including the client and someone else wants to go that way, that happens as well. And then you just have to go by the hierarchy and just, you know, if the soup wants to go one way and the client wants to go the other way, which is rare, but it can happen. Uh, you still gotta do what the soup wants because this is the soup that has to present it to the client. And if the client, you know, is not okay with that, then they have to talk and come to an agreement and, and get new notes and then you continue. You just kind of, I mean, you know, the minimal uh, view of it is it's just gotta do as told, <laughs> depending on your, on your level of hierarchy and just, you know, address the notes. But that is part of company politics and studio politics of different opinions and stuff like that. Ender Perez. Hello, Jean-Denis. Whoa, thank you for using my full name. What advice can you give if I want to exercise my creativity muscle to produce entertaining and fresh ideas for a demo reel? <coughs> Excuse me. I'm not coughing for any specific reason. I have something in my throat. There's no like a <coughs> demo reel impression. Um, what I would do is I would look at demo reels, first of all. I would look at um, show reels of Animation Mentor, Animate, uh, I Animate, Adam School, Adam Squad, like all those schools out there, right? I would watch and see what is the current state of demo reels, of animation level in terms of quality and polish and look and ideas. So you can kind of see what your competition, quote unquote, is. Um, the 11 second clubs, so we'll look at the top 10 um, submissions. So I would look at outside you know, information and, and examples so you don't live in a bubble, first of all. It's not about those are blinders, but anyway, you know what I mean. Um, so I would look at what are people doing? So A, it's an inspiration, uh, and it's also for you to show what you shouldn't do, because it's been done before. Also, if you look at many, many things, um, you will see repetition. You will see that, hmm, everybody used this rig, everybody used this sound piece, everybody used this acting idea, or this gesture, or this look, or whatever it is. So I would just look at that for A, uh, an inspirational way for what not to do way. Um, that's just us kind of see what the landscape is out there. Now, if you want to do something that's more creative and, and entertaining, um, I think it comes down to you acting things out and going outside and looking at people and, and kind of being influenced by real life. As in, you go to a park, the airport, the DMV, there's like the classic examples, but some of these are more or less difficult. If you show up at the at the airport and you start looking at people that might be weird and strange same thing at a park with kids and if you're the only adult there weird so you know this depends where you go but my point is that you go out looking at other people and looking at real life for inspiration mainly because those are all new ideas they haven't been filtered through the mind of another animator because if you look at if you only look at animated movies or tv shows for inspiration it's going to just be a repeat. All your ideas will be based on, on other people's ideas that have been interpreted based on, on real life examples. So it's just kind of a rehash of ideas. So it's cool to look at other animation movies and TV shows and animators work online, again, for inspiration and kind of like, this is the bar. This is how good my stuff has to be. But I wouldn't look at it as acting inspiration or idea inspiration, unless you really look at that kernel of ID and really go the other way where like that's cool let me do the opposite or whatever you want to do but I would just not copy what other animators have done because then it, again it wouldn't be um, like you said fresh um, so if you look at real life real people and you look at that and you interpret that and you caricature that and stylize it and go through your process and your filters and then produce that animation then it's going to be new and fresh I would do that it would be kind of a a balance where you're leaning heavier more towards your observations and your ideas, but still look at what are people animating so to see what's out there. Kind of what are people doing like with a specific rig? Like, oh, I didn't know you can go, you can do this with this rig and go this far and do those subtle uh, shots or whatever it is. Uh, and I think that's cool. It's cool to be inspired by other work, 
And um, I mean, if you, if you follow me on Twitter, I retweet stuff all the time from people. And I, that's why I do it because I get inspired by other people's work. And I go like, man, that's really cool. That's the minimum level. Now I got to be better than this. And I got to work harder and get those better ideas and all that stuff. But it wouldn't be, mm, that's cool. Let me do this as well. Then it's just not original. It wouldn't be creative and, and, and fresh, like you said. So that would be my advice. Abdul Fahim. I heard from someone, oh, welcome back. I heard from someone inside the industry saying that juniors have to work both their shots and their seniors shots and supervisors will shout and treat you like S-H-I-T. Is that true? No, but I don't know, unless mother your company. What are the black sides of industry I have just heard and learned AM blogs and other sources talking good about industry. And when I hear these types of comments from artists, I just get scared. Okay. All right, let's go one by one here. There's a lot to unpack here. So. Supervisors and leads will treat you like crap and yell at you. Um, well, let's put it this way. Not a dilemma. They, uh, I have never been shouted at and I've never been treated like crap. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there's somewhere a company out there and a person. Um, could it be someone internal, a lead or supervisor? Probably, maybe. Uh, would it be a client? Probably, maybe. I mean, it depends on their position, their level of stress, their what they have to deal with, like who knows why someone does this. I'm not saying it's good. Uh, I'm sure it happens somewhere. Let's put it this way. Um, I have not experienced it. I have never done it. Um, so I can't really answer that. Does it happen? Probably. People are people and someone's going to be stressed and do something. Um, so I can't really tell you about that. I don't, I don't really hear that it's common, to be honest, from what you hear, you know, rumors and things. I don't know. That doesn't seem to be a thing. Um, and you just get scared um, reading through your, call, your questions. No, so uh, as a whole, I mean, you're gonna, you are going to encounter weird people, mean people, backstabbing people, because you're dealing with people. That's why I keep repeating people. You know what I mean? Like to me, it's always the movie industry is kind of like high school with more money. You're gonna have certain specific people and egos and clicks and just groups of people. There's always gonna be something that's gonna rub you the wrong way. And it might be even something that other people find okay, but you're not okay with that. And I'm not talking about harassment or all kind of stuff that's clearly bad. It just it might even be little things that you don't agree with, that you don't want to be associated with. You just again, you're dealing with people, but you being yelled at. I mean, I can see this um, where it's not internal, but from an, an external party. I'm not going to say clients. It could be whoever, but mainly because you are if you're working with people within the company, you're going to you're going to keep working with them. You know what I mean? It's going to be, it's not going to be, oh, I met that person once and they can yell at me and then they're gone doing their other thing. Like you're still, you still have to continue working with people. I mean, you have to learn to deal with stressful situations without yelling at people because you're going to keep working with them for years and years and years, hopefully if you're still employed there. So it's, it behooves people to be nice. And to me, it seems like internally, that's going to be less the case, if at all. Um, and that's what I'm saying, maybe a third party person element where it's just a short amount of contact and they can go out. But again, you know, it's like, I'm not, I'm not saying it's, it's good to do that and to yell and shout, obviously, but you always have to kind of look at, well, what's their position? What, what is their pressure? What is their moment? Like, what are they dealing with currently? Again, not to make excuses, but sometimes you have to kind of also look at a certain amount of sympathy and empathy of where is that person coming from? And just, you know, so you don't also yell back or whatever it is, if, if you're ever in that situation. Uh, but as a whole, um, I don't know, animators at ILM are really nice. So again, this is one of the things where I, I can't really answer it um, because I haven't experienced it and I don't know. But I wouldn't say don't be scared. If it happens, it's, it's an exception. Um, because of what I what I have experienced in my 16 years, what I hear from other people, uh, it just seems really uh, like a, an exception. And I hope you can be not scared. We'll be fine. Helmet Thunders, <laughs> that's an awesome name. Do you have to be a very patient person to be an animator? I love that this question comes right after. Was that right after? It is right after. Um, yes, yes, yes. You have to be a very patient person person to be an animator um, for many reasons. You have to be patient as a student. You want to get that job, but you got to go through all the classes, the exercises, work on your reel. 
uh, and you see other people succeed, you have other people getting jobs. I mean, there's so much that can happen. You just gotta be patient and keep working. It starts early on. As an animator, you're dealing with something that's on a frame by frame basis. So you're gonna be, you have to be patient just with that workflow where you can't just film yourself and act something out and then it's done. No, no, you're gonna go frame by frame and tweak those muscles and shapes and arcs and body mechanics. It's a lot of work. You gotta be very patient for sure. And then once you're at a company, and again, this is from my blindness, from my point of view of the company that I have dealt with, you gotta be patient with, you know, maybe the rigs are not ready, but then the, the sequence has to be done. So you might be working with rigs that are still in progress. So sometimes you did something and then there's a rig update and that kind of kills whatever you animated, you have to redo it. So there's a lot of redos because of technical issues, because of changing opinions and minds and notes from internal you know, people or clients. Um, because that's the process. It's a, it's a creative process where no one has the right answers right away. And that's normal. You're going to have to go through changes on your shot because you someone, someone had better ideas, the creativity blooms and you have better ideas for this and that influences the rest and has a ripple effect. I mean, it's just, it's not going to be a static thing if you are, to me at least, in the creative field because it is creative and you create new things and it influences other things. There are always going to be changes with it. Now, after a while you get used to it and you don't, you don't have to be that patient anymore because that's just a workflow. But at the beginning, and especially if, yeah, if you're new to this, um, you will have to be patient uh, for sure. So I think there are many, many levels to, uh, what, to what you have to deal with as an animator, junior to senior to whatever. Um, and yes, I think you have to be very, very patient. You might like something that you did, but then you're gonna get notes and you'll have to tweak this for a couple more weeks, even though you think you it was done. And then, you know, most of the times you're gonna see the end product on the on the screen and go like, yeah, they were right. It was actually needed to make all those changes because now the final thing actually looks better. Or it's a note that you don't understand because you might not have the big picture view and then you see the movie like, oh yeah, I did this change because this happened earlier and I needed to connect these and I didn't know that and blah, blah, blah. So there's a level of trust in terms of what people tell you to do. Uh, and if on your end, definitely uh, patience is, is a big thing. And patience with your day-to-day -day work, patience with maybe your career aspirations. You want to be this, this, and this, and within I don't know how many years, maybe that happens, that doesn't happen right away. You don't get hired out of school right away, or whatever it is. So yes, it's a long answer where I can just say yes. You have to be very patient. Rushikesh, Rushikesh Shinde. Sorry, I'm pronouncing names, crazy town. Thank you, sir. Your information helps us a lot. You're very welcome. My question was, while animating creatures, what things we should think of? That's a good question. So for creatures, it really depends what kind of creature it is. So if it's something that is a real creature, like an alligator, an elephant, or whatever you're gonna do, you will have real life reference that you can draw upon. If that's English, again. Uh, and you can use that where you don't have to copy one by one unless you do, unless it's something that someone wants to be exactly that from a sequence that you found or a shot. Um, so you have to think about what is the creature that I'm animating. Is it a real one? Then you need to look at what is that real creature doing. That to me is like, it has to be grounded on reality and based on that creature. If you do a creature that doesn't exist in real life, you have to think of, well, what can I do to ground that creature in reality? And even though it looks weird, I can put in real creature behaviors that are people who watch this go not, they don't watch this and go, ah, oh, yeah, this looks like a gorilla or moves like a gorilla. They might go, yeah, I believe this. They don't know why, but it's because movements are based on real creatures. And this could be head darts and movement and mechanics or just whatever it is. So I would look at that. Is it a real creature that we know and reference? Is it not real, something that we see or know? Then you have to put in other things that from other creatures to ground that in reality and makes it more believable. Um, and sometimes, to be honest, sometimes you have creatures that just look super weird and you have no reference, um, then it's gonna make it up. Um, but these are the things that I would think of like, as the big blocks. Um, other than that, and this goes for humans as well, but like, what do we do with creatures? Again, it, it, it's not different than with humans. Like humans, if you do, because I talked about, in, in, about that in class yesterday. When you have humans, you do your acting, humans still have to be aware of the environment. So if you're talking, doing something, and something happens, a loud sound, as a human, you're still gonna react to this. Or uh, whatever it is, whatever outside influence in terms of sound or weather or, or environments or something that you walk on or whatever, it's gonna influence you as a person. Same thing with a creature. If you have a creature and it's not like there's fire, you know, an explosion or something, fire shows up, creatures don't like fire. They're gonna go or whatever. You can't just have no reaction to that element. 
So to me, that's then the next level of what is the creature? What is the thought process? What are they doing? Is it a creature that's full on 100% real or is it a creature with human behavior and acting if it's a cartoony thing? But they still have to be aware of their surrounding, react to their surrounding. And because they are a creature, they're going to react in a different way where one creature could do like that. Another creature could do whatever defense mechanism of opening ears or flaps or eyes roll back. So you have to look at what their properties are if they're based on real creatures. Uh, and if not, you can make them up, but they're going to have a specific creature behavior. Um, so I will think about that. Um, and as always with anything, you know, the sense of weight and mechanics. So like, is it a mouse versus an elephant? They're going to walk differently. The sense of scale is going to be different. Um, stuff like that. It's a long list that is very similar to, to human um, behavior, but it would just be that. But like, before you do any of that, the acting type of thing, the main structure to me is, is it real? Or is it made up? If it's real, study the real stuff. If it's made up, draw from real stuff to make it believable. Um, and either way, look at the basic structure. How do they move? What's their gait? What's their mechanics? Why do they walk like this? How fast are they? What would they never do? Like if you have a sloth running, that would be weird. Like you look at certain properties of, of, of certain animals and make sure you stay within that wheelhouse and within that, um, you know, the parameters of that creature in terms of mechanics and behavior and so on. Hope that makes sense, I'm rambling. I'm gonna leave it at that. Ah, another question from you. Which kind of demo reel makes your identity different from the other candidates? Which are those golden points which will create the difference? Those are interesting questions and kind of hard to answer, um, but they're important because what I tell my students is that, you know, it's, it's your reel that's gonna get you the interview, but it's your personality that's gonna get you the job in a certain way, I mean, more or less, plus minus. Um, so what's going to make your identity different? It's exactly that. It's your, it's your sense of timing. It's your personality. It's your sense of humor or sense of entertainment or whatever that is going to make your real difference. Now, I don't have a list of things of do this and you will be better than everybody else. You'll be funnier than everybody else. It's just kind of up to you what, you know, your sense of timing, your sense of humor is. Um, but I think in terms of the points that you bring up here, that is what makes the demo real different. Because the thing is, you look at all the demo reels, like I said before, you look at the quality in all the schools and the show reels, you're gonna see a very high level of polish. But polish can be learned. And even if you don't have it quite there yet, you might learn it while at the company. If you have, uh, if you go through an internship, you might learn it during that internship time where you learn the company's techniques and what they do. So that's something I think that's achievable through a lot of work and practice and repetition. But that's the base level, right? That's something that everybody should be able to do. Like a high polish is not something that's gonna stand out, it's just something that's almost uh, a, a requisite at this point. Like you gotta be able to polish, you know, the crap out of your shots. But then what makes it different to me is just, you know, I hate to say original creative ideas because then you might ask, okay, well, how do I get original creative ideas? And then I go back to the other question by observing real life and getting new uh, influences and, and, and mixing that with your sensibilities and then creating a new idea through that, which is all very theoretical and I don't know how actionable it is to you. It's not like a list I can give you. Um, but how does it make it different? by avoiding, like looking at every, what everybody else has done. So you avoid what has been done before. So you consciously don't pick certain ideas because you know that's been done before. Um, and then it's again, like a combination of what do you see? What do you observe? What are the things that you know that you then repackage into something new mixed with you? And that's something that, you know, I can't talk about because you are you and you're an individual person and you have your own sense of humor. You have your own sense of timing. Um, and it's just, that's just something that will make you different. Um, but yeah, going back to what I said, all you can do is make sure you don't repeat what other people have done. You obviously don't copy them, don't rip them off um, and observe things that are new and fresh and original by looking at real life. Have, have a life, basically. If I give you some form of answer to this, have a life, don't just watch animated movies and animate all day, do other things, go dance, go do something, archery, whatever you want to do, have hobbies and be around people, maybe travel if you can, it depends on your finances and your time, but experience other things and that will give you new ideas that other people haven't gotten because of their other unique experiences, if that makes sense. It's a very vague answer, but that's kind of the best I can answer that question. Holy moly, Joshua, Joshua Kuskowski, Kuskowski, 
Um, that's a long one. I'm going to read the whole thing here. Thank you for these videos. You're very welcome. I always learn so much. That's awesome. I'm, it's making me want to take a stab at character animation. I'm a generalist environment artist seven years now. Wow. Awesome. Cool for you. Also cool that you're inspired to do something else. I reached a burnout and I'm trying to stay involved and not give up on this amazing industry by trying something completely out of my wheelhouse. That's cool. If you see this, can I have your opinion on something? This is random. Trust me, I'm full aware, but I have an ESFP personality type. I love people and I pay close attention to behavior, movement, emotion, and try to gauge what they might be thinking or feeling in moments to better understand them. That's awesome. And before I read the rest, that's great as an animator. Do you think this would translate well into <clears throat> character animation? Yes. Barring, bearing, barring obvious technical requirements? Yes. Also, I really want to find a good character rig to work with, to learn with. Any suggestions for that? Thank you for your time and what do you do here? A fountain of invaluable information. Thank you for your kind words. That's that's too kind. Um, to go backwards here, um, good characters and rigs. I do have Animation Buffet and I post rigs there and I have my rig reviews. So if you want to be um, on the lookout for rigs, I recommend Animation Buffet where I have links to other sites that constantly post rigs. I'm not saying Anime Buffet. Animation Buffet is the only thing, um, but I try to combine all kinds of findings, but there you will have links to other sites with even more rigs. So I would just start from there probably. Um, not because it's my site, because I know that's like the main thing that I would say, because I know there are rigs there. Um, and in terms of all the things you brought up, yes, I think this is all very, very important. Um, paying close to attention's behavior, paying attention to people's behavior, uh, movement and emotion and, and figuring out what they're thinking or feeling. Yes. So my quick answer is yes. I think this is great. You have to, you're a people person, you have to observe people. You have to think about their thought process and why they behave like that. And then their emotional process and arc and, and change in something when the character is exposed to a situation, a problem or conflict, uh, all that. So yes, 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 yes. Everything you brought up, yes, I think this is all great. The better you can understand people and their behavior, their motivations, uh, the acting choices, all that is great. So if you never look at people, if you don't observe people, if you don't study people, um, and you just animate bouncing balls, it, you might, you're gonna have a harder time thinking and, and creating performances um, based on, again, human behavior and their reactions and all that. Um, and if you do all of this, what you just said, I think you're gonna have a, a I would say an easier time. It's gonna make it better and more believable. I'm not gonna say it's gonna be easy, it's always hard. Animation is hard and you need patience just to go back to the other question. Um, but yes, I think overall, this is all very, very great. Daniel, Daniel Shamampira, Hamampira, Chamampira. Sorry, I, I don't know, I don't know. Hi JD, hi. My question is, do you think you can still be successful as an animator even if have very bad, uncreative acting decisions? Um, yes, I would say yes. Why? Because you might be doing work that is not acting heavy. You know, it might just be cycles, where it's more about modern mechanics. It might be also mechanical, where you do more machinery animation or vehicles, you know what I mean? Um, or even if you do human or, or creature, whatever that has acting, um, you might not rise to a level where you might be a leader soup where you are creating the performances and leading people in terms of those performances. You might just be just an animator, that's totally fine, where you are given those ideas and you're led by someone with creative acting ideas and you're just gonna do what you're being told to do. Um, and that can, you can last and it can be very fulfilling. Um, it really depends on who you are and what you want to do. You know, it's like the more I work, the more I see the pros and cons and kind of the benefits of you just work on a show where you're being told what to do and you have no creative input in terms of you're leading a team or sequence. You just get your shots, you get told what to do. You have your own ideas to some degree. Show it in daily, then you work and that's it. It's also very, very satisfying, dare I say, because you have your goal, you know what to do, and you just you put out the music and work through those shots. I think that's pretty cool. At the same time, what I also like is that when you have a sequence that you're in charge of, and you're in charge of all the animators, and you're in dailies, and you figure things out, that's also very satisfying. Um, but sometimes it's also very draining in terms of the energy and the creative inputs and things you have to do. Is there's more, definitely more to do. There's more responsibility. It's more stressful to some degree. Um, and maybe you don't like that. Or maybe you want this for a couple months and you want to take a break. I think, you know, all those different positions as an animator, they're all very valid and they're all 
needed at some point for you potentially you know you have maybe too much to do or not enough to do you want to be more uh, creatively fulfilled and sometimes you have too much of that you just want to work and not worry about other things so yes i think you can be successful and it can be rewarding it really all depends on your state of mind and your current level and your priorities and your wishes and dreams and uh, it's all very subjective. Some people don't want to be a lead, they don't want to be a supervisor, and some people just want to be doing that. They want to be more in a creative leadership position and not the down and gritty animation work. And some people want both. I think it's all valid. It's all. It's all. Um, it all depends on you. And I think you can be successful. Yes. Um, that being said, again, it depends. Just to go back to really answer that question, it depends on your idea of success. You know, if you are you happy that's successful or is your idea of success that you want to become supervisor or director well if you go to that level you're going to have to have ideas you're going to have to tell people what to do and you're going to have you might be the springboard of creativity that other people latch onto so it really depends on your definition of success let's put it this way rushikesh shinde i'll be back uh how to manage time schedule for a shot to complete it in a deadlines. I'm just reading what I'm, what I'm seeing here. How much your own acting reference matters more. And as a fresher, we get frustrated when things goes wrong. So what we should do for that. Okay, let me just unpack this. How to manage time schedule for a shot. You're gonna have help. I'm talking about if you're working at a company, because you're gonna have production that's gonna help you with uh, deadlines and targets, and they're gonna check in with you. And um, so, Managing is also up to you, obviously. You gotta know if if you get a shot and they say it's due in five days, you need to know that you can do this in five days. And I tell that my students right now in class, they should write down how long did it take them to finish the shot. A cycle, a weight assignment, an acting piece, a gear change, whatever you have, like a sit down assignment. But you should pay attention to yourself early on as a student already, how long it takes you to do certain shots. So you can self-manage yourself. Self-manage yourself. My English today is fantastic. So that you know that if someone asks you, even as a student, hey, you need to do a cycle, how long is it gonna take? And you can say a week or three days or 10 hours or whatever it is. So that starts early. And that way, as you get into a production side, you will be more comfortable with managing your schedule like that in terms of just like how long it's gonna take you to do a shot. Now, that being said, you're gonna be dealing with multiple shots, uh, problems with, with potential rigs or shots, um, dailies and meetings. So it's kind of, um, you're gonna have help from production, but at the same time, you just have to be aware of what you're doing and where your shortcomings are and be honest with yourself. And then you can, you need to write things down, whatever your process is, but it's just, it's just kind of a learning process uh, and how to manage it. To me, it's, just, it's, a, it's, it's a mixture of analyzing yourself and knowing your strengths and limits, observing yourself and writing things down or just being aware of what, how fast you are, what you're doing. Um, and then it's also a matter of experience and patience where you just, sometimes you, you just get better the more you work on this because of repetition and familiarity and experience, um, to complete in it in the deadlines. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing again. You just, you know, like if you might get a shot and then you just have to be honest with yourself that you can do this when you say, Oh, here's a shot. Do you think you can do this in 10 days? You know, don't go like, Oh yeah, I can do this knowing full well that you can't just because you want to impress someone and then you're not going to make it and that's bad for the deadline and bad for the shop so just be honest with yourself um but it is also part of experience and time um i hope that answers it in some way i feel like it's kind of vague how much of your own acting reference matters more it really depends you might have great storyboards or previous to work with um sometimes there's nothing and you have to do your own acting uh, maybe you're bad at acting and maybe you just ask a buddy and then he or she will film it for you or you can film them and then use that acting so whatever you need but it depends on the shop sometimes your own acting is super important and sometimes it's not and as a fresher we get frustrated when things go wrong what should we do for that get over it <laughs> sorry um you're going to get frustrated just just don't don't worry about it don't 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 have it define your define your life this is so ridiculous I'm saying that you're going to get frustrated, but that's the process. You know, it's that's going to be work. You're going to be frustrated with all kinds of things. Just, I'm not saying don't don't pay attention. Pay attention in terms of learn from it, try to fix it, and don't make the same mistakes again. But it there's always going to be something that's frustrating. So you can also choose. 
to just not worry about it as much. Like, all right, well, I know this is coming. I know this is this type of show with whatever type of creatures or that type of personality that works with whatever you're gonna work with or the story points or whatever. And after a while, you know, this is these are the things that are gonna happen on the show. So you're already mentally prepared. And then it's kind of up to you. Are you gonna pay attention to that and really and get get upset? Or you can choose not to be upset, like ah, whatever, and just do your thing. You know, this kind of depends on how pragmatic you are. Um, but again, it's also experience. You just after a while, you just you deal, you learn how to deal with it. Now you might ask, well, how do you learn with it? Uh, maybe you have to ask other people. You have to ask other people like on your team. I'm not saying you know, but you're asking me right now. I'm just saying you ask other people who are dealing with the same things so that they can tell you how they deal with it. Because again, it all depends on who you are as a person and what you're dealing with that frustrates you. So me pontificating about things doesn't really help you because it's my experience and my situation. So you have to look at, are there other people that deal with the same things? And then you can ask them so they can give you pointers with a similar situation. Hope that makes sense. Hope that helps. And I think that's it. Question 31, 31, there you go. Uh, yeah. So that's it. I'm gonna look at or if there are any remaining questions for a part 10, because it's been a while, I gotta look at all that stuff. This might be the end, uh, but that's it. I'm gonna leave it there. That's another, what is this? Potentially half an hour, 40 minutes of um, questions and answers. As always, if you do have questions based on my answers or new questions, comments are open. You can uh, ask all kinds of questions and I can do a new Q&A. Of course, this doesn't have to be a answers only, you know, questions thing. Um, and again, this has been long. So if you're still watching this or listening to it, thank you so much. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you for watching, of course. Um, and I'm going to post more. So as always, if you want to be updated and notified about all that stuff, subscribe and hit that bell button because you want to get all the notifications uh, if you're interested in that. So and that's it. I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. And until the next Q&A or until the next clip. Mm -hmm.